you know, there's products you, you put out and nobody buys it. And it's just like in your face, obvious, like this is not working. You got to do something else. Well, there's a lot of products and it sounds like this is where you were that are in this gray zone where there actually is customers. There actually is some pull. The, the upside is, yeah, at least you have something going. The danger is you can convince yourself that you have a lot more than what you really have. Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo. I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. Today we have Hung Wei, the CEO of Maptin. Maptin provides software platform for indoor maps and wayfinding. They're based in Waterloo. They have 80 employees and they've bootstrapped their way to almost eight figures in ARR. Welcome to the show, Hung Wei. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, the topic of today's episode, pretty big topic actually, is how to find product market fit. And we'll be going through really the entire kind of mapped in story, but we're really going to focus in on the details and the steps that you took to really nail down product market fit and get into a point where you are now, where you, you have that demand, you have that pull, and you have a solution that you feel really fits what the what the market needs. As I understand, there was kind of, you know, you started with with one solution and then you kind of had to jug and jive until you understood what, what kind of the pains were. And so that's what we're going to go through today. So maybe like for starters, if you could take us back to the early days, I think you were at Velocity and Accelerator and Waterloo when, when you came up with the idea, like what was that like? And just what was the, the first idea for Mapped In? The original idea for Mapped In came out of a side project, right? Like I would describe myself and my co-founders originally as accidental entrepreneurs. We were bored at school. We joined a residence that said, you have to work on some side projects. We wanted to do that anyway. And the first idea was, we called it Google Maps for the indoors. Let's help people find stuff on campus. Let's help students find classes on campus, like know where stuff is basically. Um, and that's, that's how it all started. We kept working on that for about a year. Um, you know, an hour on a weekend here, hour on a weekend there until a random collision led to us getting introduced to the general manager of the local shopping center, Connors of Mall. And Sandra Stone's still one of the all time biggest heroes of mine because she said, Hey, I take shots on stuff like this and digital experience is important to us. It's September right now. Can you guys deliver by Christmas, by November? And I knew in my head we could, we weren't there yet, obviously. Um, and that's when I took a year off school, wired all the money in my bank account at the time as a second year student to some California company that provided some hardware. And, and we did pull it off. And that's how, that's really how Mappin started. Did they like pay up front or anything like that? Or you just took a complete gamble that the things would work out? No, it's, it's a gamble. Like we basically, you know, it was the biggest number I could make up on the spot in terms of an annual license. And it's like a really small number by today's standards. Um, and because there was hardware at the time, like they wanted you know, people who know about Mapton might know us as the company that does those big shopping center directories where you can search for stuff and touch the big screen. Thank goodness we don't do the hardware anymore. Haven't for years. Back then it had to be all included. So we charged them a monthly license, but we didn't charge them for the hardware. I, I financed it with my, again, my five figure life, low five figure life savings. Um, and, and it was basically a deal where we'd make that back over the first 12 months and the second 12 months would be a little bit of margin, but it, it was real. Okay. And so that first solution looked like what, I mean, you had the software to actually enable like those, those indoor, you know, hardware maps you click through. Was there like an, an app as well that came along with it in terms of that first kind of idea? Yeah. So, so the original idea is a, it's a pretty, I call it a pretty dumb one at this point, making apps for wayfinding, right? So the mall wanted an app essentially that runs on that big touchscreen so that you can search for stuff and get a map for like, I'm looking for shoes or I'm looking for Aeropostale. Here's how you get there. Um, that's super intuitive, right? It made sense to turn the old piece of paper thing into a digital thing that morphed into, okay, I've got it on the directory now. Now, can you put it on my website? And it, you know, it's an app for the website essentially. And then can you make an actual app, which, uh, which we did as well. So I think that's like the, the fairly obvious idea and the hard, you know, the thing that sucked about that idea was it was essentially consulting, uh, right? Like mall A wanted it, their brand, their color, their schema, Mall B, the next one wanted it totally different, uh, but we didn't realize that going in. Yeah, so I'm curious how that how that plays out, right? Because I can imagine. I mean, you're you're pretty young at that time, second year student, kind of in your early 20s. You have, you know, arguably an enterprise contract. I don't know how much it was. Maybe it was 50k, 100k, but it was, you know, it was probably meaningful. And 
and it seems to be working. I mean, you're selling software, sure, it's custom made, but it's it, so. What kind of mode do you go in at that point? Obviously, you build the first version of that, and, and I assume you deliver it to that client. Then you start. Do you start getting into kind of like you know sales mode? You're like, okay, let's hit up you know all the malls in Canada or U.S. or whatever. What, what, where do you go? Well, first, I wish it was fifty or hundred k. Clearly, I did not dream as big as Pablo on, on the spot. <laughs> VC um, man, what can I say? <laughs> so, I mean, again, accidentally all of us got into this saying, well, I guess we have a business now or at least one customer and took it really seriously. Um, I was the least bad at talking to people among the founding team. So it was my job to be the CEO now and talk to people full time. Um, and of course I just, you know, yes, let's go talk to all the other malls that we can find. Um, and th not an easy proposition when you're a nobody, uh, right? Like we, none of us had family connections into this industry. None of us had any personal connections. We were engineers or computer science students at UW. And they don't really pick up the phone and just take your call, right? Like people hammer them all the time for shiny widgets. And do you want to use my flyer service over your flyer service? Like cold calling is not fun. Try to do a bit of that. Actually through random collisions, our second, our second customer wasn't even a mall. It was the school of the University of Waterloo. Our third customer was, if I'm not mistaken, Casino Rama in really Ontario, um, you know, helping, well, basically helping mostly senior citizens because that's their target demographic find slot machines, which is their favorite way to gamble. Hard to do. There's like a hundred thousand machines sometimes in the floor and they rotate uh, often. So that was an interesting one. But again, it like every single use case was in the end different, right? The, the mall wanted it like this. The school wanted an app. The casino wanted custom integrations with their, with their slot floor layouts. And it, it, it was really just an educational exercise and, here are three different types of building owners and businesses that want indoor mapping and wayfinding, but what are the what are the variables in that, and and why do they want it, and how do they go about it? Uh, and from all that, we we learned a bunch of you know really important stuff in hindsight that allowed us to then build what became mapped in today. So we'll move into that, but maybe just going back because I do think it's important. Like, what was your mentality at that point? Was it okay, people are, people are signing, people are paying, let's build this thing, this is awesome. Or was it like, you know, were you aware at that point that, wait a second, I have three customers in three different verticals, you know, where am I going? It's hard to describe how naive and not like dumb we were about this, right? Like YC, I think by that time was two years old or three years old, maybe like not that old, basically. Paul Graham hadn't written half his essays. Um, <laughs> and And like, you know, I like no one was talking about startup. Everyone was talking about going to Apple, which is where, where the other path in the road was for me. I guess the only thing I was thinking at the time is better not fuck this up. Right. Like we've got, we've got three real customers. We've got at least one employee at, at that point that we were paying like a co-op student. And this guy's awesome. Um, like he's like, like really scrappy dude did amazing work for us. Didn't come from a lot of means, uh, so like, I remember when I first met him, he was like crashing in the velocity dorm and then we hired him as a, as a co-op. So like that guy needs to get paid. Like I at least still have some life savings. So it was really important to me that we didn't disappoint any of those people. And it's like survival mode, right? Like hopefully every day you chip away at it. And I think maybe back then we would get like a new lead every month just from random efforts that I wouldn't even say were that targeted or, or, or effortful. And you compare that to like today when I look at mapped and we get like five leads a day and I just look at it and I, I feel happy because I remember how much work each lead used to take. So how, it, cause this is the interesting thing about product market fit, right? Like you've got the, and I've heard this many times, like, I mean, it really is a spectrum on one side of the spectrum. You never really fully have it. I mean, you kind of have it, but then you've got to keep changing because the market keeps changing or whatnot. But on the other side of the spectrum, you know, there's products you, you put out and, and, nobody buys it. And it's just like in your face, obvious, like this is not working. You got to do something else. Well, there's a lot of products and it sounds like this is where you were that are in this gray zone where there actually is customers. There actually is some pull and you can, the danger there, the, the upside is, yeah, at least you have something going. The danger is you can convince yourself that you have a lot more than what you really have. And that's what I'm trying to pull out here. Like, you know, and, and the thinking around, because at some point you realize it, right. What was, what was that transition? Like, I guess at what point, where did you get to with this first product and at what point and how did you start thinking like, we've got to build something bigger or we've got to build something else or it's not really going to scale sort of thing. So, so I, I guess, you know, 
we we got really bad validation from going on Dragon's Den, which is like I'm almost embarrassed to say that you, you remember we did that. It was a huge deal, by the way. It's a big <laughs> deal because like again, startup wasn't cool. Dragon's Den, though, at least people knew what that cool. what That's the right. heck that was about. Um, and we went on. We looked really good. They they cut it so you look really good or really bad, and we just made the cut for really good. And and like and then I remember all my friends calling me the next day, being like, "Dude, like, when are you gonna buy us dinner?" Right? And like I'm thinking, man, I'm this is this is small beans still. Like this is not you know this is not, this is still a really small operation. But we we got a lot of social validation, which I wouldn't even recommend people go chase. Uh, but we got that by accident. What we didn't get from that was customers, because you know if you're selling lawn chairs, Dragon's Den is awesome. People on their couch buy lawn chairs off the TV. They're not buying indoor mapping software for their mall, right? Like that's not enterprise buying behavior. So, so that was bad validation. I think the good validation came later. For me, I I I'd always had an interest in the product behind what we were shipping the mall. So the mall, the school, the university, the uh, the hospital, the casino, they all wanted the app, the the app that helps people find stuff. Let's say what I found interesting to build, and I still wrote some code back then was the map editor behind the scenes. We realized that every single time we sign up a new customer, the first thing they do is send us like this picture or PDF file of their map that's been printed out on their side. They've like scribbled out what's wrong, scribbled in what's right, scribbled in what's coming next week, taken a photo of that and sent it to us and said, can you make this look good and put it into your app? And that's how they've been maintaining indoor maps, it turns out, in their respective businesses forever. And they just had a digital agency that turned it into a website app. And we were essentially that digital agency plugin. So we hated doing that work. I thought, surely there's a better way to do this on our side. So just for ourselves, we wrote a really rudimentary map editor to make it easy so that the next time they sent us incremental changes, I don't have to re-Photoshop the whole thing. I can just make those incremental changes on our side. Efficiency tool for me. And I always felt like that tool, A, I had an attachment to it. I built it. Makes sense though that like, you know, this this seems like something that would be more useful at scale. Um, but the aha moment for me was at a trade show in Vegas where all the malls get together every year. There was the CIO of a really big mall company that walked up to our booth. And by then we had some pretty big customers buying our apps at scale and we were maintaining their maps behind the scenes for them. That customer said, hey, my malls aren't that nice. I don't want this wayfinding stuff. Like we're strip malls, we're power centers. Like there's not even an indoors in most of them, but this map making tool that you just happened to show me, because I, I could tell he wasn't interested in, so I just showed him whatever I could show him. And he goes, yeah, no, that's that's a really big problem. I've got a thousand centers and maintaining these maps suck. It's 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 super painful. For internal, just to be clear, for internal use case, like operationally. They for their leasing for plans. Right, like because they need a source of truth. Like if you manage a building, you've got eight different use cases for digital maps. One of them's for the visitor. One, it turns out, is for leasing. Every time you're renting out space, you got to show what the space is right now. So leasing is a big one, and that's what he cared about. But then later on, we learned that there was one for security. Right, the fire escape thing that needs to be posted by law. The security guards need a copy. The insurance company needs a copy. The city needs a copy. The, the the garbage collection company needs a copy. Where do I actually go to grab the right cans and stuff? And they're all following the same workflow. We learned incrementally over time, but by then we had a hunch that, hey, what if all these people are doing what the mall marketing people did for us, which is they print out the CAD file, they scribble it out, they scribble on it, and they take a photo and send it to a contractor uh, agency and say, please make that look good for your purposes. What if all eight of those groups were doing that? Uh, and it turns out they are largely. So, so I think that confirmed what was more an, an, an intuition or maybe just an interest in building tools over apps anyway. And we had built this tool for ourselves. But once I heard that in the next couple of months, I just told the team, we're going to really invest in this tool. This is not just for us anymore. Let's see if our customers, our existing mall customers, and we had, you know, in the tens of customers at that point, let's see if our customers can use this too. And, and it turns out they really liked using it. it they prefer to edit themselves and self-serve, as we call it today, versus call us. It, it was faster to just go in and type your own words than, you know, imagine imagine you didn't have Microsoft Word or Word Processing or Excel, and the only way you could change the spreadsheet that you're using is to call somebody over the phone or email them and say, please update the cell for me. That's crazy, right? Like computer provision people should be able to self-edit. And that was the insight is that, you know, while every building might want a different app for some mapping use case, they're all going to want the same 
productivity tool for maintaining their own maps. And, and we had stumbled upon it and really learned about it and, and gotten to know it intu in, intuitively because we were in the app making business and, and they were willing to share then their underlying problems with us. That's perfect. A lot of questions on that. Maybe the first one is when you, so you go to this trade show that happens, what do you do with your, let's say they'll call it a dozen customers. Do you, do you call them all up and tell them about this idea? Do you build the thing and try and sell it? Like what's your next move at that point to validate that? Oh, it's not just this one CIO this is a common problem. Yeah. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm tempted to kind of paint it as like a really clear, like, aha, go do this. And then boom, boom, boom. Um, it's more like, you know, that was the big aha. Maybe by then we already had one or two of our mall customers have access to it because they wanted, they had asked for it. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. But like, yeah, that's cool. Please use it. Right. And it wasn't that secure. We didn't have privacy concerns like we do today in InfoSec. And certainly there was no two-factor authentication, but they were happy to log in and do it themselves. And, and then we thought it was a one-off. This guy says, no, that's all I want. Okay, so that's not a one-off. Uh, and now let's go contact the remaining number of our customers. And it was likely just me reaching out to them and saying, hey, can I show you a demo of what's been happening behind the scenes? And like, do you want to log into this? Right. And, and then, um, but very quickly, I think I switched my sales pitch. So for example, a really big customer that we won in Canada is CF. It's uh, like CF Eaton Center, CF Sherry Gardens. It's, it's like the branded luxury mall that most people would know. And we weren't the first indoor mapping company to show up trying to sell apps to malls. In fact, there wasn't many other competitors that were already there that we had to displace. And the only way uh, we displaced them out of the really big ones that they obviously cared a lot about was the CMS, was the, the, the content management system, the editor tool. Um, so by the time we showed up with CF, I said, hey, you know, we here's here's you know we do the apps really well too but here's this map editor that allows you to self-serve and here's why that's good for you and it fits into your various workflows and we're starting to think about you know other workflows like leasing that this might plug into well and it, i don't i don't even know what exactly i said that resonated but enough of it did so they took a shot on us and and we rolled you know today we have you know definitely cf but most of the malls uh big malls in the world are, are using us and i would say it's the bet on tools that really unlocked it. And, um, you know, the slam dunk win was the next big customer we got, which was Simon Property Group, the world's largest mall, mall owning company. It's $60, $70 billion market cap. And I remember calling their VP of marketing at the time. And he had heard this pitch, you know, from seven different startups that were all trying to sell apps. What's, so what's special about you? It's like, well, you know, we have this CMS that comes with the apps that allows you to maintain your own maps. And that's really important because your malls change all the time. And, you know, when Santa Claus shows up for Christmas and he's in a new spot, you need to be able to self-serve. It's like, yeah, I know that's important, but like, how do you do that? Well, you know, we have this web tool, you can log in, et cetera, et cetera. And his answer was bullshit, show me. And so we scheduled a demo that afternoon, did the demo, he recorded it, and that led to procurement. Um, and that, that's the world, that's like the world's largest mall customers. So after that, everything else, just everybody else in the world said, okay, I want to know what Simon's doing. That's important. And it turns out that tool that the, the indoor mapping tool that allows like a non architect expert type user, like an every, every man user, we call them to edit their own maps. That's useful, not just for malls, but you know, today we're working with like 10% of the fortune 500s. Uh, headquarters, their office managers are using maps in tools to maintain. I just moved a pot of desks to make room for more desks. Here's where they are now. They can maintain that themselves. Um, it, it seems to really like it's worked out for us. It was, it was a lucky find, but a good bet because every building on earth that's professionally managed um, has paper scribblers, not experts. And, and if we can build tools for them, this is a really big business. And so do you still do like there's the custom side of your business, you could argue, which is building the apps. Do you still do that part of the business? Yeah. And luckily we've done enough permutations of it now, and we have enough people that we can just standardize those products too. So, you know, you go to our website and they look like products and genuinely it's one code base and maybe there's configurations and like feature flags that you can turn off on and off based on your licensing tier. So it's like, it's all SaaS now, but in those early days, like sub 100, uh, buildings at that scale, you know, we didn't have the cycles. We didn't have the bandwidth. We didn't have 
you know, the ability to actually build configurable products. It was just a lot of forked apps. So, so if you, it's not like you started with one product and then shifted to another, you just, you added another component to the, to the core product, which puts you on another, like compared to all the other vendors, because I would argue it's probably pretty hard to differentiate as an indoor mapping app. You know, everybody's kind of pitching you a similar thing, different, you know, different UIs and things like that, different pricing. Yeah. Uh, this was the thing that kind of set you apart. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Like, you know, we'll, we'll be, we'll be as good or slightly better on the app side, but anybody can build an app for you once. Anybody can draw a map once. It was investing in tools and realizing that it's about having self service, like self serve tools for like my mom who can use Excel, but will never figure out AutoCAD. And she needs to be able to edit a map uh, if she's an office manager or a marketing manager at a big professionally managed building. It was that investment and, and the double down there, which wasn't really rational for a long time, right? If our only goal was to win malls uh, and we've won malls, but if that was it, we could have just done the behind the scenes mapping update work the whole time. It still would have been a really profitable business. Like we didn't have to make self-serve tools. Um, it did help us win faster, right? Because the Simons of the world understood it, but we probably could have caught, like won it out anyway. But luckily we did invest in these tools. And I, I talked to investors who look at like our headcount breakdown at 80 people. There's like way too many engineers in their mind versus salespeople, right? Because we've always been investing in product, but it's this product, the tools that, you know, now firefighters are using to maintain maps of indoor buildings before they run inside. Um, literally yesterday, so, you know, this is... August uh, 31st. So August 30th, 2020, uh, 2022, the governor of New Jersey puts out a press release saying, I'm, I'm allocating six and a half million dollars of funding to map all the schools in the state of New Jersey because Uvalde happened. And maps of schools are really important. Well, again, that's not an app, right? That's data. And how do you produce the data of these schools that are constantly changing? You need tools. And it's not architects to go survey every single one. That'll cost hundreds of millions of dollars. You need something that a firefighter can use, a police officer, a school admin, like you know, our vice principal at Lisger should be able to go around and just figure this out. And so I'm really glad we've been investing in those tools. And it was always a distant bet in my mind that these tools should be useful for any building owner. But it was waiting for those building owners to have a digital use case that would then require a digital mapping tool. Ten years ago, no one cared about digital maps. Now almost everybody does if they're trying to do something indoors. So, you know, in your case, there was kind of a few, there's a few signs that kind of came inbound, like the, the trade show story and a few others that led you to explore this, these tools that you were already building a little, a little further. We're like, I guess, what's your advice to, you know, there's probably many, many founders listening to this that are caught selling a product that either, well, let's talk very specific to your case, like that's in a market that's relatively crowded in a market where it's unclear how you might you know, really scale it, get to a really big size, you know, having, having gone through it and now being able to think back to what might've been the optimal thing, like what advice would you give them in terms of what, how they should be playing? it? Well, you know, first, if, if they're in a market and they have customers and they have customers that are willing to talk to them and pay for their existing products, like, first of all, good job guys. Cause that's hard to do in the first place, right? If they're anything like me, they didn't grow up with you know any sort of business background. It's not like my mom owns, you know, my dad owns a mall and just told me like this is a really big problem. Go solve this problem, kid. Like I had to go learn this stuff. You have to, you know. I, I remember it was like Ashton Kutcher, of all people, said, "If you work stocking shelves at Home Depot, you're an insider on Home Depot specific things, right? Like you know which products are flying off the shelf sooner, and you know that for some reason this ant killer is selling better than that one." Um, and you just don't realize that that's like a good insight, but you're there and most people are not. But if you're trying to compete for in the space of what's an actually good idea and a scalable idea, realize that just by being in business and having enterprise customers or just customers that pay you money for something that is a commodity gives you insights into stuff that you take for granted, but most people don't know. Most people, when they try to think of new ideas are sitting on their couch and they're thinking about the same things as any naive person and those ideas are highly competed and you know, you're not going to find anything that way. So I think it's not a bad thing to be in the business of doing something useful for somebody that maybe doesn't scale that well and just keep your eyes open and be thoughtful about, hey, you know, actually this thing that you, know, you guys don't seem to 
no mall wanted mapped in to build mapping tools. They just kept sending us stuff that forced us to do some work and we hated doing it. And then we realized, well, if all the malls in the world and all the buildings in the world keep doing it this way, like this is a really big problem, but no one, no one expressed it until much later at that show. But by then we were ready to hear that, right? We had already built that tool for ourselves. I was ready. I had the tool ready to show them. And when he confirmed it for me, like, boom, okay, now, now we, now we need to double down. But I, I would just say, you know, keep an eye out for those insights and realize that if you're in any niche, even the most un unglamorous one, you're learning stuff that most people don't know. It feels like one way to summarize that would be like, sometimes the obvious idea, if I can call it that, is, is kind of the customer discovery for, you know, the big, you know, truly innovative idea. I think so. Yeah. So maybe shifting a little bit, like kind of where are things at now and, and what's the marketplace evolved to? Like, I can't imagine you're the only, you're, you're the only company selling, you know, this mapping, this type of mapping tool. I mean, are you, and, and if not, like what has your ability to, because you've been in the market, like what kind of edges that gone you? Well, so we, I, I would say we have two buckets of competitors, app competitors and tool competitors. Um, so in the app world, it was mostly startups. I, I'd say we're by far the biggest indoor mapping startup in the world uh, in terms of customers, revenue, square footage, et cetera. And it's, it's, it, and one way we're doing that right now is because we have these tools and big customers, big partners really recognize that. The people we think of as having made really good tools are like $100 billion household names, right? Like Autodesk makes really good tools, right? Autodesk, I don't think, thinks of themselves as an indoor mapping company. Right? It just so happens that architects everywhere really like AutoCAD. And when they are paid commission to design a building, they'll use AutoCAD. And so the, the billion dollar building in New York gets built, you get a CAD file at the end. And that CAD file persists over time, even though the architect is long gone. And the people who know how to use that tool and have the budgets to figure it out are, are gone. Um, so there's just a gap in the operating world. But at the end of the day, I think you know we're, we're looking up we're not looking at, you know, who are the other app makers that maybe now have figured it out and need to check the box on having a good tool. But we want to, like, we really look up to what Figma has done in the design space uh, and what Figma is doing to Adobe, for example. There's there's a general trend in my mind that the more user-friendly enterprise tool can actually win against the super entrenched legacy player. Uh, and we're seeing that in Gmail. We're seeing that in Slack. We're seeing that in Dropbox. Uh, maybe we'll see that in indoor mapping. Perfect. Awesome. Well, maybe we'll stop it there. But, but my last question, this is the this is what we always ask at the end is, when did you feel like you had true product market fit? I feel better about it every day. But I think it was after the Simon win in the mall space. Very confident we had it then, right? Because one demo led to the biggest order on the planet uh, that unlocked the rest of the industry. And then again, like two years ago, we had a really large publicly traded B2B software company. I, I can't, you know, well, actually it's public. So ServiceNow reached out to us and uh, we became their go-to partner for return to work. So like powering desk booking and table reservations and they looked everywhere. And you would think that a really large company can just say, yeah, we'll build this thing, but it's quite hard at that point And we figured it out. So, you know, just, so that was really neat. And that opened up kind of the second horizon, the first horizon being malls, the second horizon being, I guess, everything else could play here too. And then sometime around that time, uh, we won an RFP and it was just a shot in the dark, but we saw that Homeland Security in the US put out an RFP to make tools for firefighters. And I thought, well, I've been thinking about that problem for a while. I've been talking to all these firefighters and my jaw would hit the floor when I see this, like the guy, the guy that works out all day and then jumps into burning buildings knows all, way too much about indoor maps. Like pick any firefighter off the street and they are shockingly knowledgeable about indoor maps and indoor mapping tools because they, they've been doing it this whole time. And that blew my mind. So, and then we submitted this RFP for Homeland Security and we won. Canadian company won a US defense contract to build and to adapt our indoor mapping tools for that. So I feel better about it every day. Um, I had some calls this morning with new partners that are like, man, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Where have you been this whole time? And then some days we, we have setbacks and we have more work to do. So that's just the life. Perfect. Well, really appreciate it. Maybe just to recap, you started off as a student, you know, taking something paper-based and digitizing it, something that we see in many industries. Uh, that's a valuable idea. 
and but but maybe an obvious one that others were doing too but you you went into that one and really in a sense made it customer discovery and and through that came up with a very unique insight and built a tool that has much wider impact a much bigger tam and something that you just would not have hit upon had you not been in the game i think that's the biggest lesson here is that by just being in the game even if you know it's it's maybe a constrained market maybe it's noisy but the fact that you're there means you have a lot of insights that others don't. And if you just put yourself in a position to listen to them, um, you know, that big idea might be just around the corner. And, and now you, um, yeah, you're solving a lot of important problems for a lot of industries, probably well beyond what you would have imagined in, in year one. So thanks a lot for, for sharing your story with us. It was super insightful. Yeah, thanks, Pablo. I think you summarized it much better than I can. So <laughs> kudos to you. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to see more content, check out pmf.show. 